Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, I do not have any announcements to make at the top, so we can go straight to questions. Uh, Darlene, you want to kick us off? Sure, thanks. Uh, on the commutations today, yeah. is that part of an effort to kind of jumpstart the process in Congress for overhauling the criminal justice system? Well, obviously, we would. Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, the administration has uh, been enthusiastic about the possibility that Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill could work together on common sense criminal justice reform legislation. And the White House officials have been involved uh, in the process both on the House and Senate side. And we've, uh, our role has been to try to nurture bipartisan cooperation. And uh, in the era of divided government that we're currently operating in, uh, that kind of bipartisan cooperation on Capitol Hill, particularly on something this important, uh, is pretty rare. Uh, and so we want to continue to uh, encourage them uh, in those efforts. The, the commutation process uh, uh, reflects the authority that's vested in the executive branch, vested in the office of the presidency and represents a case-by-case -case review uh, of people who have come forward seeking clemency. So uh, there are two different, the, the process is quite different and uh, the issues are somewhat different. But if uh, the announcement of 61 commutations by the President today is a reminder of why criminal justice reform is important and serves to encourage greater cooperation and progress on a broader criminal justice reform package on Capitol Hill, then we'd obviously welcome that development. The process seems stalled, though. Would you describe it as being stalled on the Hill? Well, so I... There was a period there when yeah. R's and D's seem to be working together to try to move legislation, but yeah. it, it seems stalled now. Well, I, I think um, I've... Uh, I've observed on many occasions that sometimes the legislative process on Capitol Hill doesn't work nearly as quickly as we would like or, as even, or even as quickly as one could reasonably expect. Uh, but um, at this point, we continue to be encouraged by the fact that there are advocates of this legislation uh, in both parties, in both houses of Congress. Um, let me, you know, one recent example is that uh, in the speech that Speaker Ryan delivered last week, I believe it was Wednesday or Thursday of last week, uh, his comments about the many problems plaguing the Republican Party got uh, a lot of attention, and understandably so. Uh, but he also had some comments that indicate his continued support for criminal justice reform. And look, there are not uh, too many situations in which I would say this, but uh, <coughs> Speaker Ryan's description of why criminal justice reform uh, uh, is a priority for him, I think is something that uh, many people at the White House um, would, would strongly agree with. Uh, that he talked pretty powerfully, I thought, about, how, about the importance of redemption uh, and how Speaker Ryan's faith informed his view uh, of, this, um, uh, of this issue. I don't think it was a coincidence that uh, he chose to deliver these remarks uh, and make this observation during Holy Week. Um, and look, it's just one example of a leading Republican uh, who's indicated that this is a priority that they share at the White House. Um, my guess is that as you get into the elements of competing legislative proposals, that there might be some differences that emerge uh, that will only just require Democrats and Republicans to uh, cooperate and compromise to work through some of those disagreements to arrive at the kind of solution that everybody can support. And um, I continue to be cautiously optimistic uh, that we'll be able to get that done even in an election year. Uh, I wanted to also ask about Syria. There's an interview that uh, President Assad gave to some Russian media where he is proposing a national unity government and is rejecting calls for a transitional ruling body. <coughs> is there any reaction to that from the White House? Uh, I didn't see the interview, um, and I don't know whether he envisioned himself being a part of that national unity government. Uh, obviously, that would be a non-starter for us. And again, uh, we have raised the significant uh, concerns we have with President Assad's leadership. Uh, the 
manner in which he has used that nation's military to attack innocent civilians uh, isn't just completely immoral. Uh, it has also turned a large majority of the country against him. So it is impossible to imagine a scenario where the political turmoil and violence inside of Syria comes to an end while President Assad is still there. And by there, I mean in, a, uh, in the President's office in Syria. So that's why we have been clear for years that the successful resolution of the political chaos inside of Syria isn't just critical to solving the many problems plaguing that nation in the broader region. It also will require President Assad stepping aside. Syrian forces recently retook the town of Palmyra from ISIL. Mm -hmm. I know that the U.S. position is for Assad to go, but how does the White House feel about the Syrian forces retaking that town? And he's also said they're going to push on to Raqqa, which is the ISIL de facto capital or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, a couple things about that. I mean, the, the first is obviously that uh, the ISIL, the actions that ISIL undertook while Palm Palmyra was under their control. Um, were terrible. Uh, they plundered precious historical artifacts that actually illustrate the, um, uh, the common heritage uh, that, um, that we all have. Uh, you know, they also carried out terrible acts of violence against uh, the individuals uh, who are responsible for protecting that heritage. Um, so Seeing them driven out of that location, seeing ISIL driven out of that location is obviously uh, a welcome development. But that doesn't change the basic calculus that I just described, uh, which is that the political turmoil inside of Syria will not recede uh, and as long as President Assad is in office. And uh, you know, that's why we continue to believe that he must go. OK, Roberta. Um, Two weeks since uh, President uh, Putin said he would partially withdraw the Russian military from Syria, um, there seems to have been a buildup in Moscow shipping more equipment and supplies to Syria, according to an analysis of shipping data and patterns. And I'm wondering um, how closely the United States is tracking that um, partial withdrawal and whether the White House has concerns about what's happening in terms of the withdrawal or, or the shipping of more military supplies yeah. there? Uh, I haven't seen the, uh, the analysis that you decided. I can tell you uh, more generally that the uh, United States and our coalition partners, including our intelligence agencies, are carefully uh, watching the situation inside of Syria for a variety of obvious reasons. Um, the early indications after making the announcement that they were uh, planning a military withdrawal uh, out of a, at least a large portion of uh, Syria, uh, that the Russians were following through on that commitment. I haven't gotten an updated assessment uh, on that, but I haven't also been alerted to any sort of change in that assessment. Um, you know, our case to the Russians uh, has been for, frankly, uh, was a case that we were making prior to, the mil to, to their military buildup. You'll recall that Russia has had a pr military presence in Syria for a long time, and they were using that military presence uh, to shore up uh, President Assad's uh, grip on power. We were concerned about the military buildup because that military buildup was used to further strengthen President Assad's hold on power. And our view is that <coughs> by strengthening President Assad's hold on power, it was only going to make it harder for us to reach uh, a diplomatic and political agreement among the variety of parties uh, who are concerned about Syria because President Assad wouldn't have nearly the, uh, the same kind of incentive to negotiate. Uh, he certainly wouldn't have the kind of incentive to consider uh, leaving the country. And we've made clear, and a variety of opposition groups have made clear, that that's what will be required uh, to uh, reach uh, a political agreement. So um, what's notable about that is that the Russians themselves identified this as a top priority. They understood. Mm -hmm and said publicly and privately that a political transition inside of Syria was required to try to bring an end to the chaos and violence there. And yet they were engaged in a military strategy that actually hindered that 
uh, those negotiations. Um, so uh, what we're hopeful of uh, is that Russia will continue to engage uh, in that political process constructively uh, and bring about the kind of transition uh, that is so clearly in the interests of not just the United States and Russia, but a variety of countries in the region and certainly in the interest of uh, the opposition parties, many of whom are representing civilians that have been innocently slaughtered by Bashar al-Assad. And can you um, tell us a little bit more about what exactly President Obama hopes to accomplish when he meets with leaders this week at the summit on, um, in the session on Islamic State mm -hmm. um, specifically? Well, uh, there are more than 50 world leaders uh, that are coming to the United States, that are coming to Washington uh, uh, tomorrow, who will be participating in the Nuclear Security Summit. And uh, many of them are countries who are making important contributions to our counter-ISIL campaign. And the President felt it was important, while they're all in town and all in one place and all talking about national security, that uh, they should have a discussion about what the President has identified as his uh, top priority. And uh, this should be a useful session to review the important progress that our counter-ISIL coalition has made. Uh, there are, there's been notable progress on the ground in Iraq and in Syria just in the last couple of weeks, particularly as it relates to ISIL leaders that have been taken off the battlefield. Um, there's also been important progress made in our strategy to uh, shut down ISIL's ability to finance their operations. And so reviewing that progress and discussing additional steps for building on that momentum uh, will certainly be part of the agenda. Um, at the conclusion of that meeting, the President will do a, uh, a news conference with all of you. Uh, so you'll all have an opportunity to talk to him uh, in at least a little bit more detail about uh, why the President believed that that uh, discussion was important to have. Okay. Justin. Um, the House Natural Resources Committee yesterday uh, released its discussion draft on Puerto Rico. Um, <coughs> Leader Pelosi said that the draft is far from what Democrats can support and would exert undemocratic control over Puerto Rico's government and residents. So I'm wondering if you guys share that assessment of the draft, if, if it being far from what you can support, and wanted to loop back on, I think, the Federal Control Board question that you got asked yesterday, yeah. uh, since that's a part of the draft. Well, uh, look, let me start by saying that at the end of last year, Speaker Ryan uh, made a commitment to try to advance legislation that would help uh, the Puerto Rican government and the Puerto Rican people uh, deal with their financial challenges. Uh, and the fact that we've seen this discussion draft put forward, uh, I think, uh, reflects a continued uh, good faith in trying to fulfill that commitment. Um, and so obviously we appreciate the constructive efforts that have been made by uh, Chairman Bishop and other members of the House Natural Resources Committee. This is another example of where Democrats and Republicans have been able to uh, at least coordinate uh, their efforts uh, with regard to this legislation. Um, like Leader Pelosi, uh, the White House believes that the current draft uh, does stand to benefit from some improvement. And you know, we've been pretty clear about what we believe is the crux of uh, addressing these challenges, and that specifically is giving uh, uh, the Puerto Rican government the kind of restructuring authority that uh, municipalities all across the United States have, uh, and that would allow them to uh, deal with their financial challenges. Now at the same time, uh, we also believe that the Puerto Rican government needs to be held accountable for implementing uh, reforms that they've committed to make. And so having a mechanism for independent oversight to confirm that those reforms are being uh, effectively implemented uh, is also important. Um, how exactly to do that, I recognize, is the subject of extensive negotiation. And there can be a lot of back and forth uh, on that. Uh, but uh, you know, we would view that as another area of um, uh, where this bill can be improved. Now, there are a couple of other proposals that we have supported that we continue to advocate, uh, and that is that the uh, reimbursement rates under Medicaid uh, that are given to the government of Puerto Rico should be increased consistent with the kind of reimbursement rates uh, that are given to uh, states all across the country. 
Uh, we also have advocated for the expansion of the earned income tax credit so that U.S. taxpayers in Puerto Rico would benefit from it. Um, the EITC is a proven uh, strategy for combating poverty uh, while continuing to incentivize uh, taxpayers to pursue gainful employment. And um, you know, currently U.S. taxpayers in Puerto Rico don't have access to the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, and we believe that should be changed uh, because it would both improve the financial standing of the Puerto Rican government, but it would also uh, improve the, uh, the economic outlook for the Cuban people, I'm sorry, for the Puerto Rican people, uh, but also for the uh, broader economy uh, in Puerto Rico. They rejected the financial stability of the boards or council's rationale for classifying net life as too big to fail. Um, so I'm wondering if you have a reaction to that, but also if you could talk about how uh, this loss kind of undercuts the administration's ability to look at non-bank companies that still are kind of represented as part of the financial sector and uh, your ability to regulate them. Uh, I'm not going to react to the specific decision. Uh, I think the Treasury Department has done that. Uh, and. Uh, you can cite their statement on the matter. But uh, you do raise uh, something that I do think is worthy of some discussion in here, which is that one core component of Wall Street reform legislation that was passed early uh, in, uh, in President Obama's presidency uh, included giving regulators the tools that they need to regulate non-bank financial institutions. This is one of the lessons that we've learned from the Great Recession, that it's not just banks on Wall Street that could potentially shake the foundation of our financial system if they make a bunch of risky bets that go bad without proper oversight. Worse yet, it could also put taxpayers on the hook for bailing them out. And if we're serious, and the President certainly is, about following through on a commitment to make sure that taxpayers are never in that position again, we need to make sure that our regulators uh, can have can exercise at least some authority over non-bank institutions because we know that non-bank institutions uh, in the financial crisis that uh, was precipitated in 2008 <coughs> made risky bets. They went south. It shook our financial institutions and our financial system, and it put taxpayers in a position where we had to offer them some assistance for making to, to bail them out. That wasn't good for our economy, uh, and we can't ever let that happen again. That's why giving uh, financial regulators in the United States greater authority over non-bank institutions uh, was so important. And uh, the President believes strongly uh, in that principle. Uh, and uh, you know, that's why Wall Street reform created the FSOC in the first place. Uh, and it's why the FSOC has been um, taking a close look at what they call uh, systemically important financial institutions. Uh, so this principle is, is one that the President believes in, and it's an obvious one. It's based on, our, uh, on the experience that we all went through in, uh, in the midst of the financial crisis in 2008, and it's why uh, the President worked so hard to pass legislation to address it. Let me say one other thing, and uh, I'll let you follow up. Many of our critics warned that passing Wall Street reform that would give regulators additional authority, including over non-bank institutions, that passing these kinds of regulations would be overly burdensome, that they would throw a cold, wet blanket uh, over uh, innovation and the dynamism of our financial markets. They were wrong. We can take a look. We, we, we can evaluate this. We can just look at the numbers and see, this, this will sound familiar to you, Every month since President Obama has signed into law the Wall Street Reform Bill, our economy has created private sector jobs every single month. And we have seen the growth in the stock market be rather dramatic uh, over that time period. So it is clear that we can effectively regulate financial institutions to protect taxpayers without stifling economic innovation and economic growth. We can do both. We have to be smart about it. but. Again, I think the results over the last five years uh, speak for themselves, and I think they speak loud and clear. Just the last quick one on tomorrow's festivities. Okay. Um, I think I was kind of uh, interested in the idea of having 
uh, both BioLab with China, TriLab with um, South Korea and Japan, and obviously we've seen a warming relations between South Korea and Japan and the one that the U.S. has invested in and, and tried to bring about. Yeah. But I'm wondering if um, that sparked any renewed concern among China that they've either uh, expressed to you directly or that you've seen sort of motivated <coughs> their actions in the region and whether or how the U.S. kind of considers that balance going forward. Well, just in the United States has uh, invested uh, quite a bit of time and diplomatic energy into uh, encouraging and promoting the reconciliation between two of our closest allies in the Asia-Pacific region, South Korea and Japan. And we have uh, welcomed the steps they have taken over the course of the last year or so to strengthen the relations between those two countries. Uh, the interests of the United States are enhanced when two of our closest allies uh, can coordinate effectively together. So we obviously have welcomed those developments, and uh, that will certainly be the subject of uh, some discussion when the three leaders have an opportunity to meet uh, in Washington tomorrow. Uh, as it relates to China, one thing that we've been quite clear about is we understand that even our close allies are going to have their own independent relationship with China. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, in fact, I think you could make a strong case that the right kind of relationship building between China and some of our allies can actually be good for our interests. Uh, in the same way that uh, the ability of China and the United States to work together can have a positive impact on South Korea and Japan. The most obvious example of this is um, in our dealings with North Korea. It is only because the United States and China have been able to effectively work together that the United Nations imposed uh, the toughest sanctions that have been imposed on, on North Korea. That will pressure the North Korean regime and isolate the North Korean regime over their nuclear weapons program in a way that has positive benefits for our allies, South Korea and Japan. So. There's nothing inherent uh, in the strength of our alliance with those two countries that should affect our ability uh, to work effectively with the Chinese uh, to promote the interests of all of our countries. Okay. Uh, Mark. Uh, Josh, a number of the commutation recipients had uh, gun possession charges mm -hmm. uh, on their record. Mm -hmm. Was that not troubling to the president in search of uh, nonviolent offenders? Well, Mark, the. Uh, the, the President and his team uh, review uh, individual cases individually. And so they're looking at um, these individual cases to determine uh, how appropriate it is to offer them uh, some clemency. What's uh, important about these cases is that many of them are low-level drug offenders. And many of them, had they been sentenced under the rules that are in place today, would have already served out uh, their sentence. And that's what made them particularly um, strong candidates to receive this kind of clemency from the Commander in Chief. Okay. On the uh, fight against ISIS, um, in the aftermath of the bombings in Brussels, has anybody <coughs> raised the idea of an article, of the triggering <coughs> Article 5 in the NATO Charter? That's a good question. No one has raised it with me, at least. Uh, and I think at least part of the reason for that uh, is that there's no denying that the United States of America stands squarely with our allies in Belgium as they confront this threat. And we do that rhetorically uh, in comments you've seen from the President of the United States. But we also do that as a real practical matter as well, that there's expertise when it comes to our law enforcement, when it comes to our intelligence community. Uh, and when it comes to other national security assets that we can offer to the Belgians as they try to protect their country and stem this uh, uh, extremist threat inside their borders. So, um, uh, so I haven't heard a, uh, a discussion uh, about this, but um, I don't know, frankly, how it would impact the way in which we have offered our assistance to our allies in Belgium as they confront this threat. Might not it require all NATO nations to um, uh, step up the fight against ISIS? Well, we obviously have an been... An attack on one is an attack on all. Yeah, yeah. But look, I, I, we have been pleased with uh, the kind of response that we've seen from our European allies 
uh, and the contributions that they've made to our counter-ISIL coalition. Uh, in certain cases, we believe that there is certainly more that they could do. Um, one example that we frequently cite uh, that remains true today is we believe that our European allies could more effectively share intelligence with one another uh, and with the United States in a way that would enhance the security of uh, all our citizens. Uh, and we continue to make that case. Uh, I don't know whether or not uh, invoking uh, Article 5 of the NATO Charter would enhance that or not, uh, but uh, you know, we continue to, uh, to make that case. And I think, you know, I don't think it is an, uh, uh, an overstatement to suggest that particularly right now, this is a case that we're making through law enforcement and national security channels with our European allies every single day. Uh, and you know, we're going to continue to, uh, to make that case because, again, we believe that it would be valuable in enhancing the national security of our allies that are under a lot of pressure right now. Uh, but we also believe it would be helpful in strengthening the national security of the United States. One last item. At the uh, prayer breakfast, President Obama said that once he leaves office, he's looking forward to three or four months of sleep. <laughs> Is he sleep deprived? <laughs> I, um, Does he not sleep late some days? <laughs> well, I um, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, uh, presumably, presumably he does. Maybe on the weekends. We can ask him Friday. Yeah, I guess that uh, if you choose to uh, choose to ask. Uh, look, I, I think the president's just making reference to the fact that uh, you know after serving as president for eight years, that uh, uh, anybody anybody would be due a little uh, a little R and R. Uh, I, but, he didn't say R and R. He said sleep. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, uh, those two things aren't inconsistent. And look, I, I think the president is prepared to spend the next nine months um, uh, 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 losing a little sleep uh, as he thinks through how he can maximize the opportunity that he has left uh, while he remains in office. Thanks. Okay, Chingy. Josh, uh, regarding the bilateral meeting between Chris Obama and President Xi. We know the nuclear cooperation will be the major topic there. And other than that, what are those uh, major issues in your mind will be at the top of the agenda? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a good question, Xingyi. There obviously are a wide range of issues that uh, the United States and China are able to effectively uh, coordinate on. Uh, certain, the best example of that recently is that, you know, our efforts to work together uh, to isolate and apply further pressure on the North Korean regime. Uh, uh, for their uh, destabilizing um, uh, activities on the Korean Peninsula. But there are other areas where, uh, uh, where the United States and China, through their coordination, can make progress for both of our countries. Uh, I'm confident that there will be a discussion about the global economic climate. Uh, obviously, this is an issue that's gotten a lot of attention in China, and that has consequences for the U.S. economy. And so I would anticipate that there will be a discussion uh, of that. Uh, cybersecurity is an issue that often comes up between the United States and China. Uh, we were pleased uh, with the progress that we were able to make in those discussions when President Xi visited the White House last fall, uh, and I'm confident that, uh, that there'll be a additional discussion of that. Uh, as we say, the President often uh, regularly uh, brings up the issue of human rights, uh, and I would anticipate that he'll bring up that issue uh, once again in his, in his uh, conversation with, um, with President Xi. Uh, once that meeting has concluded, uh, we'll uh, try to get you a more detailed readout of, uh, uh, of the agenda that they followed uh, and try to give you some better insight into uh, exactly what was accomplished in that conversation. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, th that President Obama looks forward to every opportunity that he has to sit down with President Xi. Uh, he obviously uh, 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 respects President Xi and uh, is appreciative of those areas where they have been able to effectively coordinate to advance the interests of citizens and in, uh, of uh, where they have been able to advance the interests uh, of both our uh, country citizens. We know this will be the eighth meeting actually between the two leaders mm -hmm. since 2013. Yes. So this is actually a quite high tempo of highest level engagement. So what's the significance of that uh, to bilateral, bilateral relationship between uh, China and United States? And how do we describe their relationship? I, I think what I would say is, frankly, that the frequency of the meetings is an indication of uh, how many issues uh, uh, our countries are able to coordinate on. Uh, I left out an important one, uh, which is climate change. Uh, you know, the, the ability of the United States and China to work effectively together on this issue was critical to the completion of the uh, UN climate change agreement in Paris at the end of last year. 
Uh, and the president observed uh, when that agreement was reached in Paris that that wasn't uh, the end of our work to coordinate on issues related to climate change. It actually was the beginning. Uh, and I would anticipate that President Obama and President Xi uh, will talk about how we uh, can advance <coughs> the global effort to fight climate change by taking steps inside both of our countries. Okay. Michelle. Can you say definitively whether it is the case that Erdogan asked for a private meeting with President Obama and he declined that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know what sort of request President Erdogan uh, put forward. You can check with his office. Uh, what is true is that President Obama uh, has met frequently with President Erdogan uh, uh, in the last six months or so, uh, twice at the end of last year, both in Turkey and in Paris. Uh, there have been additional, there have been phone calls uh, between the two leaders in addition to that. Uh, Vice President Biden was in Turkey uh, just in the last six weeks. Uh, and had the opportunity to sit down for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Erdogan. And I would anticipate that the Vice President will uh, sit down in a formal meeting with, uh, with President Erdogan uh, when he's here this week. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, a conversation between President Erdogan and President Obama while he's here as well. The reason for all those engagements is that there are a number of issues where we are uh, working together on. And that certainly includes uh, Turkey's uh, efforts to fight terrorism inside of Turkey, uh, but also to uh, continue to um, enhance the military pressure that's being applied against ISIL. Why not a bilat, though, since they are such an important piece of that puzzle and since they obviously have asked for a more formal meeting? Can, can you just sort of once and for all say yeah. why not a bilat yeah. with Erdogan? Uh, because the world leaders are only here for two days and there are 50 of them. Uh, and uh, that is obviously uh, going to prevent President Obama from meeting with each of the world leaders who are here. Uh, but again, I, uh, it also presumably would rule out Vice President Biden meeting with each of the world leaders who are here, but yet he is going to make time in his schedule for President Erdogan, and I'm confident that President Obama uh, will also make at least a little time uh, for uh, some kind of conversation with President Erdogan while he's here, too. So are there other world leaders, too, then, that have asked for bilats and there just wasn't time to accommodate them? Uh, I'm sure there are. Okay, and um, Erdogan today made some interesting comments to CNN saying that um, Europe as a whole has failed to um, address the significance of the terror threat that they face and that Belgium in particular exhibited a similar negligence. Um, but, but he's talking about negligence on the part of Europe as a whole. What do you think of those comments? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Europe is in a unique situation. Uh, there are the President has been focused on this issue of foreign fighters uh, since the very uh, emergence of ISIL on the global scene. Uh, you'll recall that uh, just a month or two after the President initiated military action against ISIL uh, in Iraq and in Syria, uh, he convened a United Nations Security Council meeting with other world leaders who are attending the United Nations General Assembly, a session focused specifically on shutting down the flow of foreign fighters to Iraq and in Syria. And the concern that we've had all along uh, is that individuals who traveled to Iraq and in Syria would get training, would be further radicalized, and then could use potentially their passport to return home uh, and carry out acts of violence uh, in their home country. Uh, that is apparently what, uh, 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 what happened uh, with uh, the attacks that we've seen in Europe recently. And we've been mindful of this threat. And we've been focused on countering this threat from the beginning. What's unique about Europe are two things. One is they have a relatively significant population of individuals that fit the description that I just offered. Individuals who left Europe, traveled to Iraq and in Syria, fought alongside ISIL, and have returned home. Uh, Europe is also geographically closer to that region than the United States. Uh, and again, that puts uh, Europe in a particularly difficult situation in mitigating this threat. That's why the United States uh, continues to support them as they undertake these efforts. I think the Europeans themselves have also acknowledged that there's more that they can and should do to protect their citizens and to protect their individual countries. Um, and we're obviously going to stand with them and encourage them as they do that. I mentioned uh, to, um, to Justin, I believe, that one example of how they could do that would be to improve their intelligence sharing, both among European countries but also with the United States. 
uh, that would be one uh, example of how they could begin to plug some of the gaps uh, that uh, have emerged. Does the White House feel that, though, that they have done all they can? I mean, when you have the situation where Turkey is warning them about a particular individual that's now back in Belgium, and, and Belgium, you know, obviously what happened happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and look, I, I, the Belgians, uh, the Belgians uh, have acknowledged that, uh, that that was an error and that was a mistake and that there needed to be reforms to their methods uh, of transmitting this information so that they could uh, better protect their people and better account for those potential risks. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously they're right about that. And yesterday Ben Rhodes talked about Russia not attending the summit tomorrow. And, you know, he, he acknowledged that there, there's still cooperation and there's still ongoing dialogue and all of that. But um, what message does that send to the White House? They're, they're not attending this. What's well, your take on that? Well, look, I, the, the fact is the Russians um, uh, have been able to effectively coordinate uh, with the United States on our top nuclear priority, which is preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear mm -hmm. weapon. And Russia's participation in the P5 plus one talks was critical to our uh, longer term uh, success, both in reaching that agreement, but also in implementing it. Uh, and we've been pleased that Iran has followed through on the steps that they committed to take uh, to um, ship a bunch of their uranium stockpile, 98 percent of, of their uranium stockpile out of the country. Uh, that was a key commitment that Iran made. And Russia was instrumental uh, in facilitating Iran's ability to live up to that commitment. That's just one example. Uh, but look, Russia has also effectively coordinated with us when it comes to North Korea. Uh, and they supported at the Security Council level uh, the imposition of sanctions that went beyond uh, the sanctions that were previously in place to apply additional pressure to the North Korean regime and to further isolate them uh, because of their continued development of their nuclear program. So, on those areas where, we're, where we have high priorities, uh, obviously the Russians have been uh, effective partners. But at the same time, uh, we would welcome the Russian participation in the Nuclear Security Summit. So is it not a problem at all that they're not coming? Is it not significant that they're a no-show? Well, I think uh, obviously we would welcome them uh, doing so, and they're going to miss out on an opportunity to coordinate with the rest of the international community on these important issues. Uh, I do think that it serves to further illustrate the degree to which I, uh, Russia is isolated from the rest of the international community, that for whatever reason, uh, they've chosen not to uh, engage in this conversation. And I think, um, uh, you know, I'm sure some of that is at least in part related to uh, tensions that they have with the United States and other countries and other regions of the world, including Ukraine. Uh, and this is uh, yet another consequence of, um, of Russia's involvement uh, in that uh, in that particular matter. But lastly, on the commutations, can we expect to see many, many more of those as the president leaves office? Uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out the president using his clemency authority to offer commutations to additional uh, individuals. That will only be done after a careful review uh, of individual cases by lawyers at the Department of Justice. Uh, but I, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Is there a target number that he's looking at? I mean, are we talking uh, hundreds, thousands of people? No, I, there's not a target number, simply because each of these cases is uh, reviewed uh, individually. So there's not a target number. There is just a commitment to try to review as many of these cases and to offer clemency to uh, individuals who are deserving of it. Michelle, April. I want to follow on um, Michelle. She kind of asked this last series of questions for what I was going to ask. But when it comes to the commutations in these last 10 months the president has an office, um, you say you're going through them carefully. Do you have like a large number that you're going through that <coughs> just came from different states? Or how, how are these um, lists compiled? What happens? There's a formal application process uh, that individuals who are incarcerated and want to seek clemency can undertake with their attorneys. Uh, but this is a process that resides at the Department of Justice, and I'm sure they could give you a briefing both on the details of the process uh, and how many individuals are currently going through it. Okay. So you don't, you don't know exactly how many they are sitting there to uh, be To be reviewed. Uh, I don't know, but the Department of Justice may be able to give you an idea. And do you have the numbers of those, as you said earlier, many of the people have um, low-level drug charges and, and sentences, and if they were to be sentenced now, they would uh, finish their time. Yeah. Do you have the numbers of the people who actually are in prison in the country now um, on that um, those charges? 
Uh, I don't have uh, those numbers in front of me. The Department of Justice may be able to give you some of those statistics. I think one of the things that's notable about this, uh, April, is that about a third of the individuals who received clemency today uh, were, ser were previously serving life sentences. So we're talking about people who uh, are facing sentence, who previously were sentenced to uh, terms that weren't just a little bit longer than what they would face today, but substantially longer. And there are uh, significant positive consequences for offering this kind of second chance. And um, uh, so that's why the president has, uh, you know, has made this a priority. <laughs> In the, in the weeds a little bit about this, the crack cocaine versus powder cocaine disparity. Um, when President Obama was then Senator Barack Obama, um, the Congressional Black Caucus was working on this issue, trying to lower the disparity. How um, much work or how important was it to him when he was uh, then Senator in Chicago on the Hill? Yeah. Uh, well, look, I, the, there are a variety of, uh, of questions that have been raised about the fairness in our criminal justice system. And there was important progress that was made on Capitol Hill to try to at least reduce this disparity. And that was only possible because there were some Republicans who were actually recognized that disparity and to their credit uh, were willing to work with Democrats to try to address it. So uh, we're hopeful that that same spirit will prevail as Congress takes a broader look uh, at broader criminal justice reform. Your book. Apparently, you were going to go to something. Read us what you wanted to say. What you thought I was going to ask. Well, you know, I just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I turned to the section that sort of has the outlines of our uh, criminal justice proposal and some of the priorities that we have uh, uh, said that we'd like to see included in that measure. Okay. And lastly, going back to the numbers. So typically, the last day, um, or before the last day, of the last week, or within the last month president has a lot of pardons. Should we expect a large number of pardons and commutations um, as this is a legacy piece for him, particularly on this issue? Well, the, the pardon process is similar uh, in that individual cases are reviewed individually by the Department of Justice. And um, you know, when they find deserving individuals, then they uh, send those over to uh, uh, the White House for the president's consideration. And um, you know, that process will continue, and I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, additional pardons being granted uh, before the President leaves office. Okay. Chris. Josh, a question about North Carolina's anti-LGBT House Bill 2, which you spoke out against earlier this week. The North Carolina governor cast the law as an assertion of state authority over the localities of uh, his state, including Charlotte. Does the President think the federal government should assert, assert, should assert its authority to override the state law? Well, uh, I have to admit that I, I'm not familiar with sort of the legal consequences of applying um, uh, uh, municipal, state, or federal law uh, in this kind of scenario. So I'm hesitate to sort of wade into the legal argument. I think that um, what is true is that Governor McCrory has chosen to use his state authority in a rather mean-spirited way. Uh, it certainly does not promote the kind of uh, fairness uh, and justice that our country has long stood for. And uh, that's why I think you've seen uh, the President uh, speak out when other states have pursued similar measures. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue uh, to do that. As I observed in, uh, I guess, in the, uh, uh, in the gaggle that I did yesterday, the President was quite pleased with the Supreme Court decision that was handed down uh, last summer uh, that guaranteed the uh, freedom to marry. Uh, and, um, but the President recognized, even at the time, that while that was a decision that was worth celebrating and progress that was worth celebrating, that was far from the end of the struggle. Uh, and we're, uh, you know, we're going to continue to engage uh, in these debates, and the President is always going to be on the side of uh, fairness and justice. One of the things I thought you would mention in, in your response is the President's support for the Equality Act, which established federal non-discrimination protection, protections for LGBT, LGBT people over the uh, state law. Isn't, isn't that something that would uh, have a consequence on, uh, a, a positive consequence on the uh, House Bill 2? Uh, let me check with our attorneys in terms of sort of how, what specific impact proposed federal laws could have on this situation. I'm just, uh, I'm not uh, steeped in the legal details uh, of this particular matter. So let us follow up with you uh, on that. I think I can speak 
uh, about the principle that is clearly at stake here. And, um, uh, and, and I think that principle is one that the President holds dear, and I think that accounts for uh, why you've seen certainly strong comments from me on this. And if you have a chance to ask the President about it on Friday, I'm confident that uh, the point of view that he'll express will be uh, similarly uh, assertive. I hope I get the opportunity to ask him. <laughs> Margaret. Josh, uh, President Obama back in 2009 called nuclear terrorism the most immediate and extreme threat. That was before the rise of ISIS, which is the best funded, best networked terror group out there. So are we now in sort of a nuclear threat emergency? Well, the, there's no denying that it would be <laughs> very dangerous and deeply troubling if ISIL was able to get its hands on nuclear material or even a nuclear device. And it does underscore why the President has made securing nuclear material around the globe a top priority. And since the President took office, we've made a lot of important progress uh, in that regard. Uh, the, the Iran deal the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon is probably the best example of that. Um, a large percentage, 98 percent of their stockpile of highly enriched uranium was shipped out of the country uh, and was secured. Uh, that's, a, that's a good example. Are there, you concerned about Iran selling to ISIS? Well, uh, I think the concern was just that when you have uh, this dangerous material in such large quantities, it enhances the risk of proliferation. The other thing that we know is that Iran supports terrorism. There's no denying that as well. So that's why there are a variety of ways in which our national security was significantly enhanced by reaching an agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, uh, but also to uh, ensure and verify that their nuclear program was dedicated to specifically peaceful purposes, but also to ensure that Iran had the appropriate protocols in place to protect the nuclear material that they did retain. And you'll recall that, that actually was also a key component of the international agreement, was putting in some protocols and standards related to um, nuclear security, some of which involved the United States lending our expertise to those efforts. Um, what's also true is that since the President initiated this series of nuclear security summits, uh, 13 countries plus Taiwan have eliminated their stockpile of highly enriched uranium. Uh, that is a, a, another tangible example of the progress that we have made. Um, there also has been important progress made in establishing uh, essentially a nuclear security architecture, uh, a set of standards that countries around the world abide by when it comes to uh, shipping and storing nuclear material, uh, but also in terms of deploying equipment at their borders that could detect the attempted shipment of nuclear material. Uh, all of that enhances the national security of the United States. All of that makes the world a safer place. Uh, and all of that uh, is a result uh, of the President making this issue a top diplomatic priority. So do you think the threat from nuclear terrorism is greater or less? Well, I think uh, there's no denying that the risk to the United States has been reduced because of the uh, progress we've made in the context of the Nuclear Security Summit and the series of them that we've hosted over the last several years. At the same time, we continue to be very mindful uh, of the threat that is posed by uh, a terrorist organization like ISIL or AQAP getting their hands on nuclear material. Uh, and that uh, is an important motivator, I think, for all of the heads of state who are participating in the summit this week, uh, that they recognize the dire consequences of that happening. And they're taking the responsible steps and participating in the summit in a responsible way uh, to ensure that uh, 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 the security of the world can be enhanced. But when you've talked about the summit and you mentioned this um, coalition against ISIS meeting, it, it sounds sort of like you're describing it as a check-in versus the level of threat that many feel and many intelligence uh, analysts would say ISIS poses. 
um, and reflecting the level of concern that the White House has specifically about nuclear terrorism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you expect to have um, any kind of action plan coming out of this focused meeting on an urban threat from nuclear terrorism? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it is true that the President envisions a much broader discussion about our counter-ISIL efforts beyond just preventing ISIL from getting their hands on nuclear material. Given the fact that all the leaders are here to participate in a nuclear security summit, I'm confident that will be an aspect of their discussions. But the President is interested in having a much broader discussion about our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, but again, you'll have an opportunity to talk to the President a little bit more about this uh, when he does a news conference on Friday. I want to follow up because you, you mentioned Iran. Um, mm -hmm. The administration is very proud of this nuclear agreement with Iran. Was there thought of actually inviting him to the nuclear security summit? Uh, not that I'm aware of, uh, primarily because the, the most important business that we had to do uh, with the Iranians as it relates to their nuclear program and the nuclear material that they retain uh, is something that we were able to resolve in the context of the P5 plus one talks. Uh, and so I'm not aware of uh, much serious consideration that was given to including the Iranians in uh, in this year's nuclear security summit. Does the U.S. still consider them a nuclear proliferator? Well, uh, the United States now, uh, I'm not aware of the consequences that are associated with uh, applying that specific label. Uh, what I can tell you is that the United States now, uh, for the first time, is able to verify Iran's handling of their nuclear material. We can verify that they are um, uh, not not building a nuclear weapon, that their program is focused only on peaceful uh, gains. Uh, and we also know that uh, Iran has followed through on uh, applying many of the safety and security protocols uh, that other countries with nuclear programs respect. Uh, and we believe that's important as well. You did bring up the point that you believe Iran is a state sponsor of terrorism. And the Treasury Department in the past has talked about illicit nuclear trade and, and collaboration between North Korea and Iran. So do you, are you saying that the nuclear deal that this country, uh, along with its allies, came to an agreement on this summer ends that concern about Iran illicitly trading nuclear material with uh, other groups? Well. It is going to be a lot harder for Iran to do that if they choose to do so because of the unprecedented access that the international community has to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, we're going to be able to detect uh, if they begin to uh, take steps that are either in violation of the uh, Iran agreement or if they take steps that are in violation of other uh, UN regulations that govern the shipment of materials that could potentially be used for a nuclear program. There are a whole set of, uh, 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 of prohibitions uh, that certainly that apply to North Korea, uh, but also apply to Iran when it comes to things like their missile program uh, or other technology that could be used to weaponize uh, nuclear material. Uh, so if Iran were to uh, seek to enhance their coordination with North Korea on something like that, uh, as a result of the uh, international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, we would have more insight into their activities than we ever have before. But still not confident enough to consider Iran a partner at this nuclear security summit? Well, uh, we are confident that we are able to successfully resolve many of the concerns that we previously had with Iran's nuclear program in the context of the P5 plus one talks. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Would it be fair to say the President doesn't really care if Russia's here or not? Does it matter if, if the Russians attend the nuclear summit or not? Well, I, th I think to be blunt about it, Kevin, I think we'd prefer that they were participating constructively. But uh, look, there are a lot of things that we'd prefer the Russians do that they don't do. And that has led to a situation where Russia is more isolated than they've been in quite some time. That's had consequences for their broader economy. Um, but. At the same time, it hasn't prevented us from being able to effectively coordinate on some areas, including related to nuclear security, with the Russians in a way that enhances uh, both our country's national security. Uh, uh, the Iran agreement and uh, the recently imposed sanctions against North Korea, I think, are the two best examples of that. Those things could not have happened without Russia's constructive participation in the process. But them not being here would be sort of like having the U.S. not be at a G7. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, they have such an enormous a nuclear program, 
and have had for years, yeah. them not taking part in such an important summit yeah. seems to me to be a big mess. Well, look, uh, again, we would welcome uh, Russia's uh, constructive participation in all this, but uh, it hasn't affected our ability uh, to advance the goals of our, of our two countries. Uh, let me give you a, there are a couple of other examples. The United States does work effectively with Russia to secure some, some nuclear material uh, that, uh, that's in Uzbekistan. Uh, obviously, that um, uh, this is from Iran by chance. Or? Uh, I, I, I don't know much about the about the about that nuclear material, but I do know that the that the Russians have worked effectively with the United States to safeguard that material. Uh, I don't know its current status, but it's just another example of how uh, the United States and Russia can work together, even if it's not in the context of the nuclear security summit. You know, the other thing that I would observe is the uh, is uh, is Russia's agreement early in uh, President Obama's tenure. Uh, to sign on to an update of the START Treaty. Uh, that also had a positive impact in, uh, in uh, uh, advancing cooperation between our two countries on, uh, on nuclear issues. So we're able to cooperate with them on a whole range of <laughs> nuclear issues that are high priorities for the United States, uh, even though Russia unfortunately has chosen not to participate uh, in this year's summit. Just a couple more. Uh, the uh, Supreme Leader in Iran uh, says that uh, it's the time of both missiles and dialogue making the comment that they would like to continue their uh, missile program despite the fact that there are major limitations based on the Iran nuclear deal. What's your reaction mm -hmm. to the uh, Supreme Leader's comments? Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, the, my understanding is, uh, uh, as of today, uh, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States uh, submitted a report uh, to the UN Security Council uh, to the UN Security Council documenting how Iran's ballistic missile activities are inconsistent with um, uh, UN Security Council standards. And we're going to continue to hold uh, uh, Iran to account for that. You'll recall that just last week uh, the United States uh, announced a new set of sanctions that would be imposed on Iran for their uh, continued violation of of regulations applying to their uh, missile program. And we continue to be serious about that. Uh, we've announced that uh, next month uh, the President will be traveling to Saudi Arabia, where the President will be meeting with uh, Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries uh, to discuss uh, our ongoing efforts to coordinate our interdiction efforts. We know that Iran is trying to illicitly uh, ship and acquire technology that could be used to advance their ballistic missile program. And we uh, continue to look for ways to coordinate with other countries in the region to prevent that uh, illicit behavior from continuing. And uh, so this, the President has made this a priority. And um, there have been consequences, uh, including economic consequences, for Iran's failure uh, to uh, pursue a program that's inconsistent with what's envisioned by the United Nations. Just to button that up, the consequences wouldn't impact the 150 billion of assets that were unfrozen at the completion of the deal. Is that correct? Well, the 150 billion number is, is not one that, uh, sure. but we don't. We can avoid that argument for now. Sure. Um, but uh, our concerns with Iran's ballistic missile program uh, is something that we have long had. Uh, and our efforts to reach an international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon did not address our longstanding concerns with Iran's ballistic missile program, except the reason that we are trying to and were committed to successfully completing this agreement to prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon is we were mindful of the fact that they were also developing a missile program that would make the development of a nuclear weapon even more dangerous. So that's why we made this a priority. Uh, but no, to answer your question directly, uh, no, our ongoing concerns with uh, Iran's ballistic missile program and our efforts to counter it uh, will not affect our ability to continue to implement the agreement that will prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon that could potentially be placed atop a ballistic missile. Final one for me is the uh, FBI Apple story. Uh, should the American public, from the White House's perspective, have any presumption of privacy uh, from law enforcement being able to essentially hack into their telephones or other devices? Yes, absolutely. And the reason that they should be confident in that privacy is because there are laws on the books that are assiduously followed by our law enforcement and national security officials that protect the privacy of the American people. Uh, in fact, the President led the effort uh, in Congress to reform 
some of these surveillance programs to give greater confidence and inspire greater confidence on the part of the American people in our ability to protect the American people's privacy, even as we undertake the necessary actions to protect our national security. The whole debate uh, about uh, uh, between Apple and the FBI uh, in the conduct of this investigation was actually taking place not between the two of them, but actually in a court of law because there was a judge that was presiding over this debate to ensure that the privacy of the American people were, uh, was protected. And that is the way that our system should work. And that is why people can have confidence uh, in, their, in their right to privacy, because we know that there are laws that are on the books that are assiduously followed by our national security and law enforcement professionals to protect that privacy. And we have a whole judicial branch that understands that they have a need to interpret that law to both protect our privacy, but also to keep us safe. Uh, and that's, um, that is essentially, in the mind of the President, exactly how this process should play out. Okay? Ron. Um, just on the ISIS meeting again, um, it seems like it's a unique moment because all these world leaders are here and because mm -hmm. we're a week or so past the Brussels uh, attack. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that there are some things that the President thinks the coalition should be doing more, like the European sharing information, the Turks sealing the border. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else, what else specifically are the shortcomings that the President thinks need to be plugged up in the coalition to, to move this whole situation forward? Well, let me uh, answer that in a couple of ways. The first is, let me point out that the, the counter-ISIL meeting that the President will convene later this week uh, is something that we've been planning since the beginning of this year, so even before the Brussels uh, uh, terrorist attacks. So this isn't a direct response to that, but uh, of course uh, the attacks that we saw in Brussels will only add to the urgency that's part of this meeting. I just want to make that part of it clear. Uh, more generally, you've identified sort of two of the most frequent asks that we make of our, uh, of our ISIL coalition partners, which is improved intelligence sharing uh, and improved efforts uh, to secure the uh, Turkey-Syria border. I know that Secretary Carter has talked at some length about uh, m more significant military contributions that some of our partners could make to our counter-ISIL campaign. Uh, there are a number of requests that we have made related to um, gathering intelligence about ISIL's uh, financing activities, uh, and our efforts to coordinate that on that have been very uh, useful. But there are some instances where we believe our partners could do more. Uh, I'm confident that if uh, uh, that somebody like uh, Brett McGurk could give you more detailed uh, 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 wish list, if you will, or at least a request list uh, that we have put in front of uh, uh, other members of our coalition. What we have sought to do is to capitalize on the expertise of our partners in certain areas to effectively integrate them into a broader counter-ISIL coalition to maximize uh, our efforts. And so uh, we can see if we can get you some more details about specific requests that we'd be making. On the military part of this, is the President convinced that this war, this effort can't be won without significant ground troop presence there? Well, uh, let me answer that. Well, <coughs> the President's been clear not, that. Not American boots on the ground, some boots on the ground. But I mean, in principle, I think um, yeah. the, the U.S. strategy, the U.S. part of the strategy has relied heavily on airstrikes. That's right. Now we've had Paris, we have Brussels, so on and so forth. Uh, and, um, and, and there's been progress, uh, as, you, as right. you've noted. Right. But, but in terms, fundamentally, um, does the President think that there has to be a significant ground military troop component to ultimately destroy ISIS that's not there now? Yeah. Well, our, our strategy when it comes to making military progress against ISIL and recognize that's just one component of our strategy, but clearly in a very important one. That strategy has rested upon the notion that we need to build the capacity of fighters inside those countries to fight for the security situation in their own country. Uh, obviously, the situations in Iraq and in Syria are quite different. We have a pretty effective, uh, uh, we've, we've received effective cooperation from the Iraqi central government who is committed to this fight. And uh, the United States has offered them significant financial assistance to carry out this fight. The United States has offered significant training assistance to enhance the capacity of their fighters to carry out this fight. There are even uh, U.S. Special Operations Forces that are offering some advice and assistance, even as 
these uh, Iraqi forces carry out military operations. There is no denying that their efforts on the ground are greatly enhanced by the precision airstrikes that are carried out by U.S. and coalition military pilots. That is, uh, that is our strategy, and that is why we've been able to drive ISIL out of about 40 percent of the populated territory that they previously occupied. The calculation in Syria is much different because we don't have that kind of effective cooperation with the central government in Syria. And it means that the United States has had to uh, put uh, a small number of individuals on the ground to try to organize the efforts of uh, fighters on the ground that are focused on taking the fight to ISIL. And we have made important progress uh, in that regard, too, uh, driving ISIL out of Kobani, driving ISIL out of Shaddadi, and beginning to take uh, some steps that would sever the link uh, between Raqqa and Mosul. I've heard some commentary suggesting that that could be months and months away, uh, Raqqa, a serious um, a s attack on Raqqa or an effort to get Mosul, Mosul back. Mm -hmm. So in, in the Syrian context, as you, as you point out, they're different. I is it still the belief of the administration that that can be done by enhancing the capacity of local troops without a significant foreign component? I get the ultimate question yeah. is, is the president going to say to the, the, uh, the coalition, look, if we want to win this, we've got to send some troops in now. Mm -hmm. I think the president's view is that the, uh, that the core of the fighting forces on the ground have to be individuals who are fighting for their own country. And we've learned the lessons of not pursuing that kind of strategy. Um, so it doesn't mean that there could be other ways uh, for other countries to contribute to that effort on the ground. Um, and I would defer entirely to uh, Ambassador McGurk and uh, Secretary Carter uh, to discuss exactly how, uh, what they would envision. Uh, but, you know, the truth is we know that there's a very small number of U.S. military personnel uh, on the ground inside of Syria that are contributing to that effort. They're not on the front lines, uh, but they certainly are playing a very valuable role in offering advice and assistance to uh, this uh, alliance uh, of fighters on the ground uh, in Syria. Are, are there more robust military contributions that could be made by uh, other members of our coalition? I certainly wouldn't rule that out. But the principle that we're dealing with here is that the core of the fighting force on the ground uh, can uh, and must be people who are fighting for their own country. On the uh, Judge Garland nomination, is there anything that's happened over the last day or two that gives you more hope or optimism besides the, I know there was the meeting with um, um, Senator Kirk. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you can point to as progress towards moving this nomination yeah. forward? Well, I, I think I would certainly would direct you to, to the public comments made both by uh, Senator Kirk and Senator Collins uh, in the last 24 hours that I think would sound strikingly similar to the kinds of sentiments that you've heard me and other administration officials articulate about the Senate fulfilling their constitutional responsibility. Uh, Senator Kirk said, uh, he observed, uh, and uh, when you just say you're not going to meet them and all that, it's too close-minded. Uh, there's a pretty direct rebuke of the uh, statement from the Senate Majority Leader and the Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee who said that they didn't intend uh, to meet with this individual. Senator Grassley has uh, more recently expressed some openness uh, to that, and we're working to schedule that with him. Uh, Senator Collins, in some ways, was even more direct. She said that she was perplexed her word by the position that was taken by uh, Senate Republican leaders. Uh, she said, it just seems to me to be no basis in saying that no matter who the president nominates, we were not going to consider that individual. So uh, I think that does represent, uh, I think that does serve as an illustration that more than a handful of Republicans are pretty uncomfortable with the position that they've adopted vis-a-vis Chief Judge Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court. But there are no more firm commitments, no more firm meetings, no, nothing that's definitely on the books that, um, that we didn't know about. Uh, nothing and that they I said have. The Grassley meeting is still somewhat um, not scheduled. Uh, it is not scheduled at this point, but we're working with them to schedule it. But look, there are now um, 17 Republican senators that have indicated an openness uh, to meeting with him. Uh, you'll recall that in the hours after Justice Scalia's untimely death, uh, Leader McConnell put out a statement definitively ruling out any sort of Senate consideration uh, of the President's nominee. I think this represents a significant erosion uh, in his uh, uh, 
uh, or in the Republican Party's position. I also uh, would note that there has been an, uh, a not insignificant erosion in the Senate Republican poll numbers, that we have seen the American public express some concern uh, with uh, the Republican insistence that they're not going to fulfill their constitutional responsibility. I think the American people understand that this is not a principled position that they're taking. It's a political one. Uh, and that's uh, Senator Johnson, a Republican from Wisconsin, admitted as much. He said that the Senate would be treating uh, a Republican president's nominee much differently than they're treating <coughs> President Obama's nominee. And they're doing that not because they have any substantive objection to Chief Judge Garland. Republicans say that, too. They're doing that only because he was nominated by a Democratic president. That's not the way that our system is supposed to work. And again, there's ample public data to indicate that most Republicans are uncomfortable uh, with that kind of contention. And uh, that's, that's the case that we're going to continue to make. And that's why uh, we, uh, I think that's why we've seen the progress that we've made thus far. It's not at all unrelated to the fact that the president has appointed someone who's not, whose qualifications are beyond question. We've appointed somebody who understands that it's his responsibility to interpret the law, not to advance a political agenda. And that's something that he's demonstrated over his 19 years on the bench, which, by the way, is more federal judiciary experience than any other Supreme Court nominee in the history of this country. Let me, let me ask you one more about politics, since you raised politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Corey Lewandowski, Lewandowski mm -hmm. what is, what's your reaction to what's happening with him? Well, I have to admit, I haven't been following the ins and outs of this legal case very closely, so I don't know if, well, I, look, I, 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 at least in terms of the, the ins and outs of the legal case, I haven't been following it. I don't, look, I don't know if he's made bail yet, for example. But uh, that was a joke. <laughs> you guys are no fun. I walked out here telling Schultz we we're going to have some fun today. Well, yeah. that's, that's okay. my question. <laughs> Just your reaction to him. To, to. There you go. Well, look, I, here's the thing. I, um, there is no denying that the kinds of actions and statements we've seen uh, uh, from this campaign is uh, completely outside the realm of acceptable behavior that's been observed by Democratic and Republican presidents over the course of our history. Uh, and so I feel confident in doing something that I'm always loath to do, which is to express a view that I'm confident that even President George W. Bush would agree with. Uh, and this is relevant because this is a prospect that Mr. Trump raised. I am confident that neither President Obama uh, nor President Bush would tolerate someone on their staff being accused of physically assaulting a reporter, lying about it, and then blaming the victim. That is completely unacceptable behavior. Uh, and I'm confident that I know for a fact that's not something that President Obama would tolerate. And I feel confident in telling you that that's not something that uh, President Bush would tolerate. Uh, I'm also confident in telling you that nobody's particularly surprised that that's behavior that Mr. Trump doesn't just seem to tolerate, he seems to encourage. What about how do you, the President Bush part of this? How do you know that? Or suspect well, I, that? I, I suspect that based on the kinds of principles uh, and commitment to values that despite our political differences, make clear that assaulting a reporter is wrong, assaulting women is wrong, uh, and the accusations that have been raised about Mr. Lewandowski's conduct go directly to those uh, core values. Uh, and again, I'm happy for, uh, 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 for uh, President Bush or someone that works for him to, uh, to say this definitively on their own. I'm confident that they, uh, despite our many disagreements on a range of other issues, I'm confident that they would agree with me on this one. Thank you. Okay. Colleen. Thanks. One other Trump-related question. Okay. Um, Donald Trump said last night that more countries should have nuclear weapons, uh, including Japan and South Korea. Um, yeah. That obviously I guess we won't <laughs> invite him to the nuclear security summit either. That, that seems <laughs> an interesting, interesting message, right, as the president's convening the nuclear security summit. Yeah. What's, what's your response to the suggestion that more countries should be developing their own nuclear weapons? Yeah. Well, um, that prospect would be uh, incredibly destabilizing. Uh, and um, I think the best way to sort of view this, well, I, I think there are a couple different ways to view it. Let's do it through, um, sort of through the prism of examining the situation in North Korea. Right now, the policy of the United States, a policy that is strongly supported by the broad international community, is that we should denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. 
Um, so Mr. Trump's suggestion that somehow we should encourage our allies in South Korea to develop nuclear weapons is directly contrary to a policy that the United States has long pursued uh, and is directly contrary to a policy that the international community has long supported. Uh, and it's hard for me to imagine why uh, it would be a good idea to give the North Koreans any justification or any incentive to further accelerate their nuclear weapons program. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and what protects South Korea and Japan is knowing that they have the steadfast support of the most powerful country in the world. And the United States will stand shoulder to shoulder with them as they confront the nuclear menacing from uh, North Korea. They, trade, they, they rightly take great comfort uh, in that. Uh, and it is why uh, it's particularly important that our country is led by a commander in chief who understands the consequences of his words and his policy decisions. Okay. Scott. Josh, you mentioned the process at DOJ for reviewing clemency applications. Mm -hmm. The woman that used to run that process quit in January. And thanks to USA Today, we now know she complained in her resignation letter about all kinds of roadblocks, some of them involving access here in the White House. Is the White House doing anything to address that? Well, uh, Scott, I think there are a couple of uh, concerns that she raised, and, and some of them are not inconsistent with concerns that we've had. Uh, the first is we would like to see that uh, that uh, that unit of the Department of Justice be given more resources to do their work. And in the President's latest budget proposal, there's a significant uh, increase proposed for uh, the budget of that office. Um, more generally, uh, we have seen a steady ramping up of that office's ability to uh, review applications and send recommendations to uh, the President. Uh, and we've been pleased with the improvement that we have seen that includes uh, uh, some of the work that was done by uh, the previous leader of that office. Uh, she deserves uh, some credit for that. Uh, but what the President's interested in seeing continued improvement and building on the momentum that has been built up. Uh, and we've got, we're entirely confident in the current leadership of that uh, operation uh, to fulfill the President's promise. And in his blog post today, the Council said that these individual clemencies are no substitute for broad reform. Is the Administration de-emphasizing individual clemencies? in the service of fraud? No, no, not, not at all. Uh, in fact, the President is serious about using this executive authority to try to correct uh, injustices in the system where they are detected. Uh, but the best way to do this is for the United States Congress to work in bipartisan fashion to pass the kind of criminal justice reform that would inspire much greater confidence in the American people that our criminal justice system is more effective in actually bringing about justice. Our left. I wanted to go back to the Apple and FBI case yeah. now that the FBI was able to access this phone. Uh, we hear reports that Apple wants to know exactly how they were able to do so. We've been told that this is going to be an interagency decision about whether the government <coughs> provides this information to Apple. Where do those discussions stand right now, and how involved is the White House going to be in making that decision? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I am not aware of the status of those, of those discussions. Obviously, there will be um, we value the important dialogue uh, between the government and technology companies. Uh, we obviously value the cooperation that many of those technology companies have lent to law enforcement as they uh, do things that make us safer. Uh, we've talked about some of these examples. We've enjoyed uh, important cooperation with technology companies, for example, in shutting down child pornography. Um, and our ability to work with those technology companies only enhanced our ability uh, to stop that uh, the spread of that crime. Uh, a similar statement could be made about uh, human trafficking, that many human traffickers have turned to uh, online and social media tools to try to market uh, uh, their um, criminal activity. And we've been able to work effectively with the um, technology companies to counter it. So we've been able to find common ground in the past uh, on uh, these kinds of priorities, and certainly when it comes to the national security of the United States and the ability of terrorists to carry out acts of violence against innocent patriotic Americans, uh, we should be able to find some common ground there too. Uh, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to uh, continue our coordination, not just with Apple, but with technology companies uh, in a way that doesn't undermine uh, anybody's basic commitment to uh, privacy and robust encryption. After all, the President himself has said that he's a strong believer uh, in the robust deployment of strong encryption. 
But does the federal government have a responsibility to alert companies like Apple about vulnerabilities in their products that theoretically affect millions of consumers? Well, look, what I can assure you of is that we are interested in a serious dialogue with technology companies. And I, I can't get into the, to the status of any ongoing uh, conversations, uh, but I can tell you that as a matter of principle, uh, we value the kind of cooperation that we have received from technology companies. Uh, it has not required anybody to uh, capitulate on their dearly held values or on their uh, business model. Uh, but by working together uh, and acknowledging where our uh, interests overlap, we've been able to make important progress that has protected the privacy of the American people while also uh, protecting the national security uh, of the United States. That kind of cooperation would not be possible without an effective dialogue. So we're committed to that dialogue. Uh, in general, that dialogue will continue, uh, but I don't have an update for you in terms of where the discussions are as it relates to this specific matter. And on Merrick Garland, uh, Senator Grassley this week is predicting that Democrats will eventually force a vote with the discharge petition. Is that something that the White House is more seriously considering in their discussions with some of them? Well, I uh, pointed to the public comments of uh, Senator Kirk and Senator Collins as illustrations of the discomfort that some Republicans are experiencing as it relates to their position on uh, confirming Chief Judge Garland to the Supreme Court. I actually think the quote that you've just mentioned is probably the best illustration of how uncom uncomfortable Republicans are with their position. It seems strange that the chairman of the Judiciary Committee would be suggesting that the Judiciary Committee's constitutional responsibility to consider the present Supreme Court nominee should be circumvented by Democrats. The, the truth is the Judiciary Committee and the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee should just fulfill their constitutional responsibilities. That's, what, that's, that's the way that this process should move forward. And I know Republicans have suggested that, well, they don't want uh, this process to be swept up in presidential politics. But it's a little hard for them to make that claim when they suggest that, well, this decision shouldn't be made until we've had an opportunity to play presidential politics and determine who the next president's going to be. That doesn't make sense. The best way for us to prevent this process from being further polluted by partisan politics is for the president, first of all, to put forward an individual who's, of, who's got unquestioned credentials. In fact, that's exactly what the president has done. Uh, he's put forward somebody with a strong track record, a 19-year track record on the federal judiciary of fair-mindedness and fairness and a commitment to interpreting the law, not advancing a, a political agenda. That's why even Republicans have described him as a consensus candidate. That's the best way for us to, to, to reduce the uh, political pollution uh, around this nomination. And that means Republicans also have a responsibility to fulfill their constitutional obligations. It, it, Republicans would have a much better case if the president had put forward somebody who was of questioned credentials, but who was geared toward specifically trying to influence the outcome of the presidential race, by trying to drive up turnout and trying to provoke a big partisan political fight. The president didn't choose that path. The, pe the president actually chose the path of choosing somebody that even Republicans said was a consensus nominee. And even in the last two weeks after Republicans promised to treat the president's nominee as a pinata, even most Republican senators have acknowledged that they, it's kind of hard to argue with the fact that Chief Judge Garland deserves a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. His credentials and his public service to this point demonstrate that he is clearly qualified for that important job. But I'm not suggesting that they should just take the president at face value or even Judge Garland at face value. The president put forward Chief Judge Garland's nomination promptly within four or five weeks so that there would be ample time for the Senate to conduct their usual process. And that includes giving Chief Judge Garland the opportunity to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. I described it as an opportunity. It makes it sort of sound good. Typically, those hearings are pretty tough. You're on camera for hours at a time. You're testifying under oath. And you're facing tough questions from Democrats and Republicans about a range of complex legal issues that have significant consequences for the United States. That's an arduous process. But that's what it should be. That's the arduous process that any nominee of the Supreme Court should have to undergo. Uh, and the President is confident 
that after Chief Judge Garland goes through that process, that in the minds of the American people and the members of the United States Senate, that they'll all arrive at the same conclusion, or they should arrive at the same conclusion that the president did, which is that Chief Judge Garland would serve with honor and distinction on the Supreme Court. And that's why we believe that uh, uh, the United States Senate, and particularly the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, should get to work. So can you tell us, is a discharge petition a viable option that the White House is considering? Well, right now, what we believe should happen is that the Senate Judiciary Committee should do their job. And I, I'm not, I'll be honest with you, before Senator Grassley uh, mentioned this at a town hall meeting in a way that apparently was uh, unplanned and um, not terribly thought through, I didn't realize there actually was a dis discharge petition process on the Senate side. I, now, that may be my own bias. I briefly worked on the House side and was aware of that, how that process worked. Um, so I can tell you that's not something that's gotten serious consideration over here primarily because there's ample time for Senate Republicans to actually follow through on Leader McConnell's promise to get the Congress moving again. And there's no reason that if we operate under the timeline that previous Supreme Court nominees have in the last 30 years, that Chief Judge Garland should be able to get a hearing and a fair up or down vote before the Senate goes into recess, and more importantly, before the Supreme Court begins uh, their next term in October. If the Senate doesn't do that, we will be encountering uh, uh, a situation that is unprecedented in at least recent Supreme Court history, uh, in which one judicial vacancy actually has an impact on two different Supreme Court terms. Okay, John. Thank you, Josh. Um, one question: Does the White House, through its Congressional Affairs Office, talk to any of these Republican senators? such as Senator Collins, Kirk, or Moran of Kansas, or is this all spontaneous? Is it news to you when they make statements like this as it is to us, or have they been talking to the Congressional Liaison Office yeah. at all? Well, I can tell you that the White House uh, was in touch with every office uh, of every United States Senator uh, in advance of the President announcing that Chief Judge Garland was the nominee. The President takes quite seriously his responsibility to offer advice and consent. And when we have seen public statements from individual senators indicating their uh, willingness or even desire to have a meeting with Chief Judge Garland, then we've contacted them. We followed up with them to schedule those uh, meetings. So uh, we have been in touch, but I, I'm, I feel confident that, uh, that Senator Kirk and Senator Collins here are uh, articulating their, their genuine opinion on this. The other thing is uh, Iran. Um, on January 28th, signed an agreement, I believe it was signed by President Rouhani himself, to acquire 118 Airbuses that presumably are going to be used for commerce and business. Is there any uh, evidence at all that this has benefited U.S. business in the last three months in any way? Well, uh, I guess I'd, I'd encourage you to check with, uh, with the Commerce Department on this. Obviously, there are a whole range of regulations uh, that prevent uh, extensive business ties between the United States and Iran. That's because we have concerns about the way that Iran continues to support terrorism, the way that uh, Iran frequently violates the basic human rights of their people, the way that uh, uh, Iran continues to develop a ballistic missile program, the way that Iran continues to threaten our closest ally in the Middle East, Israel. Uh, and uh, that's left uh, Iran uh, pretty isolated. Now, they've gotten some sanctions relief because they have followed through on their commitments as a part of the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, we didn't trust them to do that. We verified that they followed through on those commitments. Uh, but the, the significant limitations that remain in place on U.S. businesses doing business with Iran uh, haven't changed and uh, won't change until we see uh, Iran begin to pursue a path that demonstrates a commitment to complying with basic uh, universal uh, or inter at least international principles about um, uh, human rights and terrorism and uh, their military program. Okay. Yeah. Andrew, I'll give you the last one. Um, I just wanted to go back to, to clarify something you said at the beginning. It's the administration's position that Assad should step aside before a transitional government, not at the end of a transition? Uh, what we have said, Andrew, is that President Assad must step aside because until he does, uh, we will not see an end to the political turmoil and chaos that's been plaguing that country for far too long. Uh, it is because of President Assad's failed leadership that we have reached this point. Uh, that is the root cause of the violence and mass migration 
that we've seen there. It's also the root cause of the terrible atrocities that have been committed uh, in Syria and the hundreds of thousands of people uh, who've lost their lives as a result uh, of President Assad's failed leadership. And that's why we continue to believe that we're not going to resolve the situation until President uh, Assad makes a clear commitment to leave. You seem to be more specific on the timing. You said that it would be a non-starter for Assad to be involved in the transitional national unity government. Uh, I think what I, what, I've, what I said is that it will not, that the chaos and violence and turmoil inside of Syria will not come to an end until President uh, Assad has left office. And that has long been our position, and uh, it continues to be. Okay? Thank you, guys.